So uh, we have been uh, discussing the representations of n equals to 1 supersymmetry. And uh, to recall is that uh, when we were doing that for uh, the standard non-supersymmetric case for the Poincaré group, what we, the representations of the Poincaré group were what we know as uh, elementary particles, with classified by different spins or helicities. Uh, <coughs> actually, you can turn the argument down and say that that is the definition of a particle as a representation of the Poincaré group. And uh, so, in the case of uh, n equals 1 supersymmetric uh, uh, theories, we had already the algebra. So then it's natural to ask what the representations are. And then we were asking uh, to see if there were representations that have different particles of different spins within the same representation. And, <coughs> and actually, we were able to prove that uh, for in any multiplet, the number of bosons equals to the number of fermions. I would call that super multiple. So a, a representation of super, the supersymmetry algebra will have states in one single irreducible representation, states of different spins, but still uh, but we will have for every representation, the number of bosonic objects will be equal to the number of fermionic objects. And that, that was what uh, we ended up um, in the last uh, lecture. So that's, that was the end of last lecture. I, I proved that this was true in every super multiple. OK, any questions before I continue? No? Everything is clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so. <coughs> Today, I will be more explicit, and I will try to build the, the representations for you. And as in the case of the Poincaré group, I have to separate it between the massive case and the massless case. OK, so let me start with the massless multiplets. For uh, this, we, as, uh, as in the case of the, of the representations of the Poincaré group, I will choose a momentum, which is uh, <coughs> the, the center of mass kind of a momentum for the particle, for which, since we have to have p mu, p mu equal to 0, because the mass is 0, so then we have to have the zero entrance equals to the one of the special ones, the th third entrance, to be equal. And then that guarantees that p mu, p mu equals to zero. So the mass is zero. So for this, we have then, so so the first Casimir is zero, as uh, we were expecting. and But also the second Casimir that I defined for you in the previous class, if you plug this uh, value of p mu, it's also zero. That was the same thing as uh, that we were having in the Poincaré group, where the second customer was w mu, w mu. And w mu happened to be <laughs> proportional to p mu. And then that means that that customer was zero. This C to tilde is different from that. But if you plug the same relationship between the W mu's and P mu's, you will find out that it's also zero. So again, the representation is labeled by two zeros, which is not very enlightening. But then what the, uh, the, the states on the representation are also labeled, are only labeled by They will be labeled by momenta and helicity, as we had for the Poincaré group. The, the difference is that we, we can have different helicities 
in one uh, multiplet, but that's what we'll see now. Okay, but at least we will not write the two zeros that will label the representation itself. <coughs> Okay, so let's see how we can find the states in a multiplet. To find the states, <coughs> let's start with the algebra. So we have, uh, remember that we have the algebra Q alpha Q bar beta dot equals the conventional factor of two times sigma mu alpha alpha dot times p mu. And since we know the value of p mu, p mu is E zero zero E, and the sigmas we know what they are, so that means that this is two times <coughs> E sigma zero plus E sigma three. <coughs> so this is equal to two times E sigma zero plus sigma three. And of course this is a uh, well, components alpha, alpha dot. But sigma zero, we know is the identity in two dimensions. And sigma three, we know is the, the diagonal one minus one matrix in, in, in two dimensions. So we know that sigma zero plus sigma three is a matrix, which is, a, this will be the matrix two, zero, zero, zero. Okay, and uh, of course the two I can absorb it here, so there will be four e times one zero 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 alpha alpha dot, <coughs> and so we can see from here that uh, q one with q bar one dot is for e, but q two and q two dot is zero, and the other ones are, are zero. Okay, so that's that's for this uh, representation. That's what we have. So. The first thing we can see is for Q dos, for Q2. Question? That should be Q bar alpha dot. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes. <coughs> yes, sorry about that. So then we have that uh, uh, Q2 with Q bar 2 equals zero. And if this is zero, that means that if we have any state in the representation, that will be zero. And if this is zero, that means that we can have, this is like the modulus of a, of a, of a state. So that means that Q2 equals zero in the representation. Okay, so, so that means that Q2 annihilates essentially all the states in the representation, so Q2 is essentially trivial for us here. So the only relevant operator will be Q1 because that will give us the one in the in the antagonist. Okay, so let's let's see what we we have for Q1. So we have Q1 Q1 dot equals for e. 
Uh, how yes. can you see that uh, just by saying that the anti commutator is zero, that the expectation value is zero? Very good, because when you, when you have the expectation value, it's q q bar plus q bar q, essentially. So th th that is a, a, a positive definite uh, quantity. So you're, you're and then just you are sandwiching in within the states, and so it's, 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 uh, it's, it's zero. Okay, so q1, q1 dot is for e, and uh, that means that we can define, so we can define now a to be. Q1, yes, Q1 over 2 root E and A dagger to be Q1 bar over 2 root E. And uh, then the algebra of Q and, uh, and of A and A dagger will be such that um, A, A dagger equals to 1, because we absorb the factor of 2 root e in both. And this algebra you have seen in the past, when you were children. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so you knew what it is. And this is the algebra of, of the creation and annihilation operators so for, for fermionic operators. So, and of course, we will have a a equals a dagger, a dagger equal to zero. So that means that a, a dagger are creation and annihilation operators. <coughs> okay. So if they are creation and annihilation operators, so then we can use them. You can uh, build the representation that we usually do uh, uh, with this operator. So we start with the state that we call the vacuum, and then start applying the different creation operators to create the different states of the representation. So furthermore, also, We notice the following. The following is that the, the commutator of A with the J3 generator of the Lorentz group, in this representation, since A is essentially a Q, Q1, so we can see now that we, since we can read the commutations, commutators like a J3 acting on Q1, Q1 is a spinner in the um, fundamental representation of SL2C, so that it transforms like sigma 3 times A. OK. And A is not anything, but any A is Q1. So this will be the sigma 3 uh, matrix, both component 1, 1. OK, so, so th this is essentially what we, we have from the algebra, it's knowing that A, the Qs are, are spinners, as we saw in the previous lectures. <clears throat> OK, so that means that if I take the following, I take J3 acting on the state P lambda. <clears throat> this will be equal to J3 acting on A, so this will be equal to A times J3 minus the commutator of A, I uh, will be consistent, commutator of A J3 <coughs> acting on P lambda.
And this is equal to <coughs> AJ3 minus the commutator. We know that it's this. So it's 1 half. Sigma 3, 1, 1. times A, all that acting on P lambda. <coughs> and sigma 3, 1, 1, we know that sigma 3 is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So that the 1, 1 uh, component of sigma 3 is 1. So now we can factor out the A, because J3 acting on P lambda will give me J3 acting on, on lambda that will give me the helicity. So that will have A, J3 acting on lambda is the helicity, lambda, minus a half. Again, P lambda. Or since these are just numbers, so I can just write it better like this. And so you can see that J3 acting on this state, AP lambda, gave me lambda minus a half times AP lambda. So that means that this state is an eigenstate of the operator J3 with eigenvalue lambda minus a half. So that means that J3 is reducing the helicity by one half. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So now we have all the information <clears throat> to To, um, to construct the, the, the representations. So in the same way that a, AP lambda has helicity minus, uh, lambda minus a half, also the same argument, a dagger P lambda has helicity lambda plus a half. So one increases and the other one decreases the helicity. So to build the representation, so to build the representation, we start with one state that I call the vacuum. But this is quote unquote because it's not the real vacuum, it's the vac is, is the is the, say, the state of minimum helicity or so. <clears throat> state of minimum helicity lambda. And uh, so I call it, I call it capital omega. So that will be a state P lambda. <clears throat> okay, so I start, uh, that's my starting point, and then what I will do is start acting with the creation operators, with the A dagger, to, to build up the, the rest of the representation. I act A, A dagger on omega, and then we know that will give me an operator, a state with helicity uh, lambda plus a half, and so on. So then, then we will have a dagger omega, and that will be a state with helicity plus a half. <clears throat> and then what we will do next, it will have a dagger, a dagger acting on omega. 
to start building uh, building up states with higher heredicity. But a dagger, a dagger, since they anti-commute, this is zero. Okay. So that means that this is the whole multiplet. So the whole multiplet is essentially two particles, one of helicity, lambda, and the other one of helicity, lambda plus, lambda plus a half. So if lambda is an integer, this is a boson. And then you have the same number of bosons and fermions. And this is a super multiplet. So as I promised, we have a multiplet of particles uh, <coughs> with the same number of bosons and fermions. And they include, as I said before, uh, different spins or different helicities. And that's, that's the, the power of supersymmetry in the sense that you get particles of different spin in the same multiplet. As usual, we have to add the CPT conjugates for this. So that means that we have P plus or minus lambda and P plus or minus lambda plus a half. And this will be our massless, our massless um, super multiplet. So examples. We start lambda equals to zero. That means that we will have. <coughs> That we will have a scalar and a fermion. So that's the basic multiplet when you have a scalar and a fermion, a spin one half fermion. <coughs> and uh, so it is so basic, it needs to have a name, and uh, it's usually called the chiral multiplet. For the moment, just take it as a name. <coughs> it's essentially that it has a chiral fermion with a scalar, so it's, it's a chiral multiplet. And particular cases of that is this, if this, uh, uh, for instance, this lambda one half is a quark, then the corresponding partner will be a supersymmetric quark or squark. The same thing is if it is a lepton, then this will be a slepton. And if the scalar is a Higgs, then the convention is that the partners of a Higgs is not called an S Higgs, but it's called a Higgsino. <coughs> Just a name. You may guess that it was an Italian who, who invented it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think it was inspired by the neutrino. And uh, that's it. So that, that's, that's the current multiple. Then for lambda equals to half, we will have a fermion, a spin one half fermion, plus a spin one boson. And since it has a boson here of a spin one, a spin one are the, the standard uh, gauge multiplets, the gauge particles. So this is usually called a vector or gauge multiplet. And as, as examples, we have here. The corresponding gauge boson is a, is a photon. The partner is called a photino. If it is a gluon, 
is the gluina. And if it is a W particle, it's called the, it's pronounced Wino. These other pronunciations don't look very nice. And um, if it is the Z, it's Zeno. <clears throat> OK. And uh, so that is for lambda equals to 1 half. For this, we can add. Yes, that's a good question. Who has the question? Yeah. Yes. How do we know that the quark is a member of a scalar multiplet, but not of a, of a vector multiplet? Because in both cases, you have particles of a, a lambda equals to 1 half. You have fermions with a spin 1 half. That you can see directly from the representation it comes, because the quarks come in the fundamental representations of the SU3 group, so they are triplets. Whereas the gauge bosons, they come in the adjoint representation. So you cannot, just the group theory will not allow you to be the, the quark as a partner of, of, a, of a gluon, for instance, because they are two completely different representations of the, of the, of the gauge group. So that, that, that I think is it. So that's what, they are usually in the chiral multiplets. And usually, uh, the name that is given here, you will see in general, for this is the gauge boson, and so this is called the gauge -ino. So all of these are gauge -inos, and this is gauge. So, so in general, these are. Genus. This is gauge. Okay. OK, I will skip, and I will say later why the next case, which will be lambda equals to 1. Um, but the lambda equals to 3 halves is still interesting. So lambda equals to 3 halves, you will have a fermion and a lambda equals to 2 boson. So we will have helicity two objects, and a helicity two object is precisely what we identify as the graviton. So this will be the graviton. And then this object will be the partner of the graviton, so it's called the, the gravitin. OK. <clears throat> Um, you can see it's a feature of n equals to 1 that the graviton has only one partner, the gravitino. But for extended supersymmetry, we will see that it will, there will be as many gravitinos as, as supersymmetries we have. <clears throat> OK, so those are the examples I, uh, I will have. I, I will mention later why we don't go beyond lambda equals to 2, but I, I will mention when it's appropriate. OK, any questions so far? <clears throat> OK. So. Why is it there, sorry? Uh, uh, yes. Lambda equals 1. Because, yes, that, that is a complicated multiple. I, I mentioned before, I, I was going to skip it. It will be lambda equals to 1 will have a 3 halves uh, partner. Usually, there is no field theory that, that you can describe for. For, for, for including uh, a particle of a spin 1 together with a particle of spin 3 halves. And uh, th whenever you have a 3 halves, you have to have gravity. And that's, you have to go all the way that. At, at least uh, um, in standard field theories. Yeah. OK. So that was the mass less multiplet, which was easy. But now we'll now consider the massive multiplet, which will be a little bit more complicated. Mm. 
<coughs> and for the massive multiplet, we have the standard. We have we, we got to the center of mass of the particle, so that means that the, the momentum is just uh, m zero zero zero. <coughs> And we will play the same game. Now, substituting, substituting this uh, momentum, we plug this in the supersymmetry algebra and see what kind of algebra the Q and Q bar satisfy. Uh, <coughs> but uh, the first thing we have to do is that the, the, um, the Casimir's C1, of course, is a P mu P mu is m squared. So now the label is uh, non-trivial, but also the C2 tilde uh, is also different from zero. And it happens to be, in this case, 2m to the 4 y i y i, where y i is a super spin y i is just given by Ji minus one over four m q bar sigma q i as equal to bi over m, which were bi I defined in the previous lectures. The nice thing about this defining these yi's is that they are the angular momentum generators plus something else. However, the algebra that this uh, algebra that this subject satisfy, they satisfy the same algebra as the j's. So it's i epsilon i j k y k. And since they satisfy the same algebra, we know already that the uh, representations will be labeled by eigenvalues of the operator y square, which is the Casimir operator of this. Uh, um, of this um, <coughs> representation, and y squared is precisely this subject here. Okay, so <coughs> so I can values of y squared will be equals to say y times y plus one, etc. So it inherits the properties of the angular momentum generators. So we know now that. Uh, that uh, a representation will be labeled by a mass and a superspin, where the superspin can take these values, y to y plus 1, as a standard representation of the rotation group. However, it is not spin. It's not spin because you have this extra piece here. And then we can have, as we will see, we will have, again, particles of different spin within one representation. So for a given value of y, we will have different uh, values of j's. That you can do as an exercise to try to, to, to prove these relations. They are straightforward, but a, bit, a little bit lengthy. Okay, so multiplet. Uh, okay, so I will write so for multiplet. Label by mass and this super spin number. <coughs> okay. So <coughs> to to get to the representations, to, to define, to <coughs> obtain the states and the representations, we use again the algebra. So it's Q alpha, Q alpha dot equals 2 sigma mu alpha alpha dot P mu. And, uh, since P mu is essentially is m 0 the only thing that gives you sigma 0 m. 
so that will be 2m times uh, the identity. Okay, so we have a similar situation that we had before, but before we had uh, here one and zero, and now we have one and one. But that means that we have to do what we did for the Q1s before, but now we'll do it for Q1 and Q2. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the only thing. So we have two sets of creation and annihilation operators. So we will define A12 to be one over square root of two M, Q12, and then A12 dagger to be one over square root of 2m, Q bar, one bar, two bar. <coughs> and again, so this implies that this satisfies the algebra AP, AQ dagger equals to delta PQ. And these objects then <coughs> are uh, creation and annihilation operators. Excuse me? Q1, comma 2. So instead of writing A1 equals to this times Q1, and A2 equals to this times Q2, so I do the same for 1 and 2 at the same time. So now we have two sets of creation and annihilation operators. So we can define the, the vacuum state again. Which I call um, omega. Such that A P acting on omega equals to zero. It's annihilated by annihilation operator. And then we build up <coughs> um, the rest of the multiple from it. So omega will be a state which will be <coughs> labeled by, by the following thing. It will be, it will be labeled by the mass. And uh, <coughs> I hope I haven't erased the phrase O oh, Y. Yes. Look at Y is J minus this object. Okay. I'm using omega to be annihilated by the A's, so it will be annihilated by the Q. So Q, this acting on omega, this part will be zero. So essentially for omega, the spin and the super spin are the same. OK, so then this will be j equals to y. So that means that uh, this is a particle. If I fix a value of y, the spin will be equals to y. And then, of course, it will have a momentum. And it will have a j3 associated to this value of j. Okay, so it's a standard, it's a standard particle of a spin J, and if it has spin J, you have two J plus one states labeled by J3. That's one single particle, but that will be only the first element of my multiplet that I call omega. And I build the other ones by acting on, on with A dagger. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. <coughs> So the rest for the rest of the multiplet, <coughs> I 
Again, we uh, this, I, I can use the same trick as before. That uh, remember that um, a j three a one j three has a spin has a yes reduces the value of of, um, of j three by a half, and the same thing then a one dagger. On J3, that will give you J3 plus a half. But if you play with the algebra, since, since sigma 3 has a 1 and a minus 1, for A2, it's exactly the opposite. So you do the same thing I did before. But now for A2 on J3, that increases the, the value of the third component of the spin, whereas A2 dagger. Decreases it. Okay, so this is due to the fact that uh, the representation sigma three is a one and minus one. So, so it's a one in the first entry and for a one. So that that the, all the tricks we did uh, in the previous proof that I just erased uh, were for this case. Now for this case, it's the same trick, but you have to use the the minus one in sigma three, so that, that there's a change of sign, and that's what you get, plus and minus, there. Okay, so that means that if I um, act on uh, omega by a two dagger. Let me add, I act on omega for a one dagger. A one dagger acting on omega. It will be adding uh, j three to j three plus one half. So it will have as follows. It will be something as follows. So uh, just, just bear with me. So it will be K1 M <coughs> uh, yes. Let me see what I am trying to tell you here. So omega has spin uh, j equals to y, and uh, and it's labeled by stage j3. When when I, I act a, a1 dagger on omega, I know that a1 dagger will increase the third component of of the spin by one half. Okay, so that would that would have a j3 plus a half here or j3 plus a half. However, that can come by raising the spin by a half or by lowering it, the j by a half. Okay. So that both will give us components of j3 plus or minus a half. I'm assuming here so far that that we don't have y, that y is different from zero. So you, you start with something different from zero. So you can subtract one half. Okay, and this k1 and k2 are nothing else but the uh, Clebsch-Gordan coefficients. So you have a, uh, you can see that as a representation again. Remember that a1 dagger is, is a q, it's a q, and a1 dagger being a q is a spinner. So you have a spinner multiply something that transforms a spinner, multiplying something that transforms as as a given representation of the rotation group. So it can be a spinner or something else, and the product of these two things will give you. <coughs> Uh, objects that that you have different values of angular momentum. So in this case, you will have 
uh, it will increase by one half and it will uh, decrease by one half and decrease by one half. Remember the sum of uh, angular momentum? Recall, you have J1 times J2 equals to J1 minus J2 plus up to J1 plus J2. Remember that? This is um, one of those basic theorems in, in, in the, for the rotation group. If you multiply two spins, then it's, it can be decomposed as a sum of spins, where the first one is the difference, the modulus of the difference, then you start adding one up to the end, then you, you, they add up j1 plus j2. So in this case, this has spin 1 half, and this has spin j, or y, j equals to y. So the product of the two will have the difference, y minus 1 half, plus the sum, y plus 1 half, and that's it. So take this as a j2 equals to 1 half. So it's j1 minus a half, and j2 plus a half. And that's, that's all you can have, OK? And again, the third components will be reduced j3. Uh, j, there will be j3 plus a half in both cases, because we know that a dagger has j3 plus a half. OK. Is this uh, clear? This is it's not clear. Shall I repeat it? OK. Two pieces of information. One is that a dagger increases the value of the third component of, of spin by one half. That's the first piece of information. Okay? And that explains why I have a j3 plus a half here and a j3 plus a half here. Second piece of information, I have the product here. You can see this as a product of two objects with different values of the spin. The A1, remember it's a Q, that has a spin one half times omega that has a, a given spin y. So when you multiply spin y times spin 1 half, what will you get? You will use this famous formula that will have, in this case, it's only two terms, because one of them is 1 half. So that means that uh, j1 cross a half equals to j1 minus a half plus j1 plus a half. Okay, so you have an object of a given spin multiplied by a, an object of a spin 1 half. It will be the difference, j1 minus 1 half. Then add 1 to it, and it's precisely j1 plus 1 half. And that's it. That's the end of the, because the, the sum ends with j1 plus j2. So you have two terms. And those are, that's what the reason we have y plus 1 half here and y minus 1 half there. So this, has, this object has a spin. Imagine omega had a spin j equals to y. This one will be a combination of two objects of, of a spin y plus a half and a spin y minus a half. Both of them, the only, end, the only thing that enters is the, 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 the fact that the, 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 the states where you have the third component of the spin being j3 plus a half in both cases because of this rule. Is that better? OK, I can try again. <laughs> OK. okay. <laughs> OK, so if you give me three more minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll close this, uh, this uh, multiplet, because otherwise it will be difficult. As I say, K, uh, first K1 and K2 are cleft Gordon coefficients. So, these are the kind of rules that you, uh, you see when you see multiplication of angular momentum so in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Okay, so I did that with a one dagger, a one dagger acting on omega. The same thing I will do with a two dagger acting on omega, and then that will be similar kind of objects. But now I have a 
J3, I'm sorry, J3 minus a half, because A2, as I told you, reduces the, the third component of the isospin, of the spin, and uh, Okay, uh, minus, sorry. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and then I, I will, so I just added A1 dagger and A2 dagger. If I multiply this by A2 dagger again to raise uh, uh, further the, 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 the value of the, of the or, or lower for the value of J3, it will be zero again, because A2 dagger times A2 dagger is zero. The same thing over there, A1 dagger, A1 dagger is zero. So the only thing that I can do now is multiply A1 dagger with A2 dagger. Okay. And that would be the end. <coughs> But this will be equal to minus itself because it's, it's a, uh, these are anti-commuting objects. And so this object, since one raises the, the, the value of J3 and the other one lowers it, so it will be its object with the same value of a spin as, uh, as, as, as omega. Of J3, okay. <clears throat> so, in total, we will have two states of the type M Y P mu and J3. One state on the form M P mu sine J3 and uh, one state of the form and uh, so you will see that if these are, if these are uh, uh, bosons, this will be two bosons and two fermions. If these are fermions, this will be two fermions and two bosons, okay? And actually, the, the total number of states here, the total number of states here will be uh, the values of J3, so that will be 2y plus 1 times 2. The total number of states here will be 2y plus a half plus 1. And the total number of states here is 2y minus a half plus 1. And then you can see that uh, you add these two. That will give us a um, 4y. 4y, this is 4y plus 2, and this equals precisely 4y plus 2. And as I have promised, you have to have the same number of bosons as fermions. So if these are fermions, this will be bosons, and if these are bosons, this will be fermions. And the number of bosons and the number of fermions are the same in the multiplet. Okay. I think I took a lot of your time, so we'll continue next day.